Before you listen to this podcast, did you know you can get continuing education hours for it? Visit heavyliesthehelmet.com slash CE to see all the accredited episodes. Welcome to the Heavy Lies the Helmet podcast. We're going to do something a little bit different today and talk about gear. Equipment and gear, the equipment that one flight clinician might carry on their person can vary greatly from what another flight clinician does. And because of that, it can tend to be a little bit controversial. Throughout our career or throughout the time that we've had the platform of Heavy Lies the Helmet going on five years now, we have constantly received this question from especially newer flight clinicians. And they want to know, what should I carry in my flight suit? Well, again, the idea of my mission profile might be different from your mission profile will make differences in the type of gear that we carry. Also, the geographical location that I work in is going to be different from the geographical location you work in. So you really can't compare apples to oranges in that sense. Yet, when you have individuals that are seeking knowledge or seeking advice, for whatever reason, on these public forums, there is always a consistent sense of toxicity from certain individuals. They might make comments like, well, all I carry is a pin and my nurse partner, or all I carry is a pin or, and my paramedic partner, or oh, I just carry, all I carry is my debit card. Now, those items in themselves aren't bad and probably we all carry, but this idea that we don't need more than that is kind of silly, especially when you're pushing on someone that works for a different program than you. I have to give my friend and our chief safety officer, Chris Sharp, a shout out here because a lot of what he does with his Wolves Den video series is he talks about equipment because this is something that he prioritizes and recognizes as important. And a lot of his ideas have also helped me in my own practice, even though there are some differences. Because Chris comes from a Central American-based SAR program primarily with Black Wolf helicopters. Operating as a chief air crewman is a lot different than what we might do as HIMSS clinicians. A lot of his focus is aviation. And of course, that is important to us. And that's why I encourage you to go over and watch those videos as well. But what I want to do is kind of give our spin as far as a HIMS clinician, an American-based HIMS clinician, some things that we might carry on our person. I've been flying for nine years now, and the equipment and gear that I carry has changed. It has constantly evolved. And I think that's how it should be with whatever it is that you choose to do. What I started with in my early in my career and what I put in my flight suit is very different from what I do now. And that's based on experience, that's based on new training and acquiring new information, learning how to use new tools. All of that is going to influence what you are carrying currently. But this idea that we can't take advantage of the pockets that we have on our flight suits to really make our job easier is kind of silly. I adopt this mindset even in my personal life. I'm someone that has very well thought out everyday carry gear on, that I keep on my person. Or I have a travel bag that I have kitted out that I take with me everywhere in a lot of scenarios where I'm traveling because these type of things make our lives easier. And the same goes for our professional lives. The gear that we have on us can make our job a lot easier and help us to take better, and help us to take better care of patients. And really that's the ultimate goal. But then not only taking care of them, but also being able to take care of ourselves and our colleagues if we find ourselves in a crash scenario. So what are some things that we can carry? I'm going to take a systematic approach. and I'm going to take you through what is currently in my flight suit. Again, going back to this idea of this being a fluid process, what I carry now might be different from what I carry a month from now. But I still think that it's important to give some insight because we have received questions about this so much. If you're someone that doesn't see this as, a, as important, all I can say is I understand, and you're welcome to go to our next podcast episode if you don't want to watch this. But I do think there is definitely a, a group out there that would really benefit from something like this. So that's what I'm going to take the time to do today. 
So what I have here is the flight suit that I personally wear. I have covered up the branding just because we do keep where we work private. But I want to take you through each individual pocket and explain why I carry what I do. Where we're going to start is the top right pocket. So right here. And I'm going to go clockwise around the flight suit. If you're listening to this audio only, I'm going to try to use the, as many descriptors as I can so that you still benefit from this. But obviously, if you're watching the video, you're going to get the full experience. Just the bad thing is not all platforms support video, which is why I'm doing it this way. But nonetheless, without further ado, let's get started. So starting with this right arm pocket, we have our pin pockets. First thing I carry is a Sharpie pen. This Sharpie is a clicker. I prefer the clicker ones, whether it's a pen or a marker, just because I find that caps can get lost and it saves me a little bit of time just being able to do that simple motion. Sharpies are obviously going to be something that you're going, going to use. You may use to write on paper, but more importantly, those non paper surfaces. As an example, if a patient's received a lot of IV fluids, a lot of times what I'll do is write the bag number on the bag itself so we, we can keep track of how much they've had. You could also use it to write on a tourniquet and put your tourniquet application time on there. So there's a lot of various uses for Sharpies. So I find this to be extremely beneficial and I always have one on me. Next to that, in this pocket, I have a pin light. This particular one is a 4.7s Prion P2. I don't even think 4.7s is a company anymore. But I really like these lights. This one, it's matte black like a lot of my stuff, which is obviously awesome, looks cool. But this is actually, this is a really good light and it works really well for pupillary checks because of the amount of lumens. If you're someone that only wants to carry one flashlight, I totally understand. You'll see that I have two flashlights and there's actually, there are some redundancies in my kit, which I will say up front, but there's redundancies after redundancies in aviation in general. And I do have reasoning behind the ones that I have. But when it comes to my pin light, I use this again, only for essentially pupillary checks or something that is going to be potentially sensitive to the patient's eyes. I find that if you are only going to use one single light, it helps that it has two modes so that you can do those other assessments outside of patient care, which again, I'll get into. But if you do carry a single light with multiple modes, I do recommend that you carry extra batteries with you, though not lithium batteries, as we've seen in some recent incidents in our industry. But nonetheless, lights are going to run out when you least expect it, just like ink pens. So we want to make sure we have a backup. Now, the pocket behind the pin pocket here, I have a couple things. First and foremost, I always keep some alcohol prep pads in this pocket. This is one of those things that it seems like I can never find when I need them. And we try our best to keep things clean in transport, whether it's prepping a patient's skin for an IV insertion or maybe cleaning the lumen of a central line before we're administering anything through that. We use these a lot, so I always want to make sure that I have those on me so that I'm using uh, appropriate technique. And then the last thing I have in this pocket is a carabiner. This particular carabiner is a Night Eyes S-Beaner, and I love these carabiners. Even though my company provides us with carabiners for free, I still spend my personal money on these because I find them to be much more practical. One of the reasons is because you have two windows here. So this allows you to keep the carabiner level and still you're actually able to, at least I'm, I find that I can get more IV bags on this shape than I can on a standard non-climbing carabiner. Also, you have the option of two sides if you needed that, uh, which again is part of keeping things level if you need to. But the other thing I really like about this outside of its construction, these are pretty heavy duty. Um, I don't know, just stainless steel, I guess, but you can look and see how thin that is. This is nice because unlike other carabiners, you can hook these in more places. One of the places that I hook on patients, if there's not an IV pole available or a ring, there is a metal part on the straps of our cot. 
near where the buckle is. And there's a little hole and this actually slips right into that perfectly. So I can have the IV bags hanging off the patient and it makes it really convenient for transport because then I don't have to worry about them the rest of the time. A lot of people who carry carabiners, they have the tendency to hang them from their shoulder straps. And I, comp I understand why. I totally understand why. Because it's convenient. It's right there. All you got to do is clip it on and it's there when you need it. The issue I have with hanging anything off of these straps is because this is a potential catch point if you're trying to egress. Even without doing the egress training that I have done personally, there's been several times just getting in and out of the helicopter that when I did have a style of carabiner, where our style meaning it was on a strap like this, that I've gotten hung up before. And then now put that in a scenario where you're underwater maybe, you have limited oxygen, and now you have to try to get these fine motor movements together to where you can get this carabiner off or get yourself loose and then get out. This could really mean life or death. So in my opinion, I don't hang anything off myself externally that I don't have to. So carabiner, that's why it goes in the pocket. Still, it's easily accessible. It's right there on my arm. It's not a problem. So now moving over to the right breast pocket. So right here, I keep this pocket open and empty. Reason being is this is where I put my cell phone. Us as transport providers, we use our cell phones all the time, whether it's checking protocols, doing drug calculations, whatever, checking our dispatch information. We use our cell phones. So because our cell phones are flat generally, that's why I put it here on the chest because it makes it easily accessible. And also being against my chest, it doesn't, it doesn't give me any discomfort. It's still comfortable when I wear the seatbelt harness. It's not a problem at all. So that's why I like to keep it on my cell phone. Then moving over to the left breast pocket, so this side, the only thing I keep in here is some photos. When I have my chest open like this on my flight suit, especially during those summer months, I find that it keeps me cooler when I don't put a lot in these pockets. So that's also part of it as well, because we want to be comfortable. We want to make sure that we can be mobile. And that's also why I have the weight distribution that I do around the flight suit, keeping that in mind, because I still have to be able to perform my job and I don't want to be overloaded. But this is really cool. This is something my wife put together for me. Uh, I think it was just on a whim or maybe dirt for an anniversary or something. I don't remember exactly, but she got some physical copies of photos of her and our kids. Uh, there's pictures of our dogs in here. Just those things that are important to me. I know it's kind of cheesy, but I like to keep it next to my heart. We do a dangerous job and I find that it, it brings me comfort when I have these on me and I can be able to look at them if I want. So that's the only thing that goes in that left breast pocket. Now we're moving over to the left upper arm. Again, duplicate pin pockets. And this is keeping in mind that flight suit pocket configurations vary. It may even be a two piece versus a one piece. This particularly is a one piece. So obviously what you have may vary from this. These again are just what I have in my setup. Again, I have another pin pocket here. I have a primary pin. This is the pin that I use personally. I like this one because it's a space pin, which means it is able to write if it's wet. Also, you can write upside down because of the type of cartridge that these carry. So I find that to be really convenient, especially if I'm out in the elements. And it's a click pin, again, of course, too. And it's fairly durable. I think this is some kind of aluminum, which is really nice. It's not cheap plastic where the clip's going to break. And then in the pocket next to that, I just have a backup pin or maybe my, you could call my patient pin. So if they need to write down signatures for consents or family, or if I just need a backup ink pen, let's say I just happen to be on transport and this ink runs out, I have a secondary pen because we use our pens all the time, as you know, whether it's charting, like I said, getting medical necessity consents, whatever you, ha you have to have an ink pen in this industry. And then the pocket behind that, 
I'm not going to show you everything in here, but what I have is my work badge. I have a secondary key card to get into other access points at the various bases that I work at. Uh, the other badge gets me into the academic health center that we're affiliated with. I have some keys that also serve the same purpose. And I have a small thumb drive, USB stick. This is nice because if you have a Hamilton T1, you can get vent rounds and pull them off the stick onto your charting. Also, it's nice because if you have to scan documents and you're at an outlying facility that's not your own, a lot of times you have the ability to do that. So it's good to keep a thumbstick on you. When it comes to the ID badges, another common practice that I see is individuals, again, want to hang their badges off these shoulder straps. And this goes back to that same argument that I said before with the carabiners. I don't do that again because and that's another thing that could potentially get hung up when I'm trying to get out of the helicopter quickly. In my opinion, we all have these name badges or these name patches rather, name tags that already say our name, say our job role. To me, a badge like that is redundant and not necessary. So I already have my ID here. There's no reason for me to have a badge hanging off that can potentially cause a safety risk. So that's my mentality and why I don't do that. Now, again, going clockwise, we're going to go down to the left leg. I'm going to start in the medial portion first, and this is the knife pocket. Now, you'll find that Chris Sharp, this was something he's actually discussed recently in Wolf's Den. And he talked about the difference between the U.S. flight suits and the U.K. flight suits. This obviously being a U.S. flight suit. But what I used to carry in here was a knife. And I found that the knife still required some fine motor movements, even though it had a seatbelt cutter on it for an egress tool. I wanted something simpler. I wanted something keeping in mind that in those intense situations, again, when I'm trying to get out of the helicopter, maybe I'm upside down underwater. I'm trying to get out as quickly as I can. So I want something that's easy to grab, only uses gross motor movements, and can get me out. So what I've purchased, you can first see there's a lanyard here. Again, if I can't get a hold of the handle itself, I can grab that lanyard and it's another point for me to get this out as quick as possible. And what it is, is a Benchmade hook or a Benchmade seatbelt cutter. I think this one is the, the four inch, if I'm not mistaken. And that's all it is, no frills, I know what I'm grabbing. I don't have to do anything as far as flipping it out. It's fixed. It's ready to go. I just have to pull it out, hook it on the seatbelt, and then I'm out. I just like Benchmade stuff in general. This thing is razor sharp. It does have some protection here around the blade, but I do try to keep this away from me uh, just in case there's any potential for cutting myself. Obviously not something I want to do. But one thing and one concern Chris had talked about in his video was putting something here, there's potential for potential, there's potential for it hitting your femoral artery in certain crashes. The way this suit fits me and the way the pocket is placed, I've stretched my leg as far as it can go. And I still have been unable to make contact with the handle of this. So outside of extreme scenarios, I don't see that as a significant high enough risk for me not to have this easily accessible where it is. And what's nice with it being in that medial pocket, I can really reach it from both my right and left hand if need be. So that's the reason why I still keep this tool here. And again, because it's a shorter hook, it allows me to have increased mobility because then I have this entire pocket that the rest of it, that's just empty and uh, doesn't cause me any discomfort. So now going laterally on that same leg, Again, we're on the thigh at this point. I have my personal survival kit. I originally bought this as a pre-made kit. It's a Survive Outdoors Longer Pocket Survival Pack by Doug Fitter. I think that's Doug Fitter. Uh, so this is, I mean, I had good intentions, so I bought it, threw it in my flight suit a long time ago. But then when I did some survival training in the Guatemalan jungles, I realized that 
some of the things in here were kind of cheesy and I probably need to make some alterations. So that's what I did. I won't go through the whole thing because there's plenty of videos on this. Uh, I will mention that one of my latest additions to this was a small Bic lighter. Having multiple fire sources is great, and this is a very easy, cheap way to get a fire source. What's nice too is I've put a zip tie around this. Now, if you were to just throw this in your pocket, these fuel buttons get depressed easily, and you could potentially leak out all the fuel in your lighter, and then it doesn't work anymore. So what I've done is I put a zip tie around this. Let me get a focus there. There we go. So I put a zip tie around to where the button cannot get depressed unless you remove that zip tie. So I know that this thing is going to fire up when it needs to. Now, if you're working in an urban setting, this is one of the arguments that people have for not having a survival kit on their person. Or they say there's one in the aircraft. Well, number one, again, going back to my friend Chris, if it's not on you, you're probably not going to have it. So you can't guarantee that you're going to have that survival kit that your company has provided because more than likely your aircraft's either going to be underwater or on fire or just maybe damaged enough you can't access that. So you want to have it on your person. Secondly, if you're working in an urban environment and you're pretty much always close to civilization, you could still have things like cash. Maybe you need to get a ride. Maybe you need to pay for a phone call. Maybe you need a snack and some drinks until you get picked up. You could have some cash. Another thing you could consider would be a charging brick. A charging brick and cable for your cell phone. Say it's at the end of a 24-hour shift and you've been running all shift and your phone battery is super low. And by the time you're able to get out of the aircraft, your cell phone battery is dead. So having a charging brick, you can get some power, get some juice in your phone, call your dispatch center or whomever to come pick you up. So those are some things, again, you might put in an urban survival kit. I also keep a knife in here. Again, I have other sharp objects, obviously, but one of the things that I also discovered in my survival training is just having a knife itself is crucial. And you can do a lot with a knife that you can't do with necessarily a seatbelt cutter. This particular one, I will say, is a little heavy. Um, but again, it's a Benchmade, and I spent a lot of money on this, so it's, it's hard for me not to use, if I'm being completely honest. But I've, again, I've put a lanyard on here to easily grab if need be. It's got a deep carry pocket clip. And this is the Benchmade triage. This is actually the knife that I had in my knife pocket previously. But again, we're talking about essentially fine motor movements. Even though I really like the access lock with this, uh, it's still, again, fine motor movements. It does have a sheep foot, sheep's foot style blade. So if you did have to use this, maybe cutting off clothes or something for whatever reason, if your shears weren't available, you're not necessarily going to stab anyone because of the blunt edge or the blunt end. And it also, like I said, it has a seatbelt cutter on it. But again, you have to flip it out. So I like to have the other bench made for that purpose. But nonetheless, a great tool. I mean, I always I have pocket life on me, a pocket knife on me in my personal life too. I just find myself using them all the time. Now moving down the leg, we're getting towards the lower leg or towards the ankle, calf side. And this is arguably in most flight suits, the largest pocket that you're going to have. And because of that reason, people have the tendency to want to pack a lot of things in these pockets, in these lower leg pockets. I don't advise that because if you've ever tried swimming in your flight suit, especially if it has equipment in it, if you load down these, it's going to be like putting weights around your ankles. And you're probably going to be wearing boots too. So it's going to make swimming extremely difficult if you find yourself in a ditching situation. So I try to keep it light from what, for what I put in here. Though obviously with their size, there's some equipment that we need that we simply can't put anywhere else because it doesn't fit. So that's an unfortunate catch 22. But again, it's important that we keep these things in mind when we're picking what we're going to put in them. Literally, the only thing I have in this giant pocket is a roll of tape. Tape's self-explanatory. I don't think I need to go into how useful it is in the job that we do. Though I will say it is still technically a loop. And again, I prefer not to have it on the shoulder strap because it could be a hook point. 
So I just throw it in the, down in this pocket. And the only thing else that goes in here goes in here are our not our narcs, our controlled medications. We keep ours on our person at my work. And so that's where they go. Moving to the right lower leg, same pocket. This one I already have loaded up. The first thing is, this is where I put my stethoscope. A stethoscope is probably one of the worst pieces of equipment we have to carry. They're big, there's not a good place to put them. So this is where it goes because it's one of the only places where it fits. This is a Lipman uh, that I've had ever since I was back in the ICU like forever ago. It's this uh, Cardiology 3, but you don't have to get fancy with stethoscopes as long as you can auscultate with it. Half the time we can't even use them if the aircraft's running. So use your ultrasound, use your other assessment tools. But I've checked that box. I have a stethoscope. The last thing that I keep in this pocket is this little medical pouch. This is the only really medical gear I would say that I keep separate from my bags that are provided by my company. And I'll explain why. So this pouch has multiple pockets. The pouch itself is a tactical notebook cover, tacticalnotebookcovers.com. I'm not affiliated with any of these companies, but I really like this. On the outside pocket, I have some extra syringes. Can never have too many syringes. And because I have my narcs in my other leg pocket, opposite leg pocket, I can administer those medications that we administer the most without having to break open my bag. And I have the ability to do intramuscular and intranasal as well. On the inside, just because of how long our syringes are with the caps or flushes, I keep two flushes and I've just put a piece of nylon around them to keep hold them together. Can never have too many flushes. Also on the inside on the left, I have a right in the rain, all weather universal notepad. These are actually waterproof. So again, if you're writing in the rain or something like that on a scene call, you don't have to worry about your ink bleeding. This coupled with a space pen is really nice. Also above that, I have this little clip. See that? What that allows me to do is if First responders hand me a patient's driver's license. I can clip that under here and I know I'm not going to lose it. Also, if they hand me a piece of paper with maybe some patient information on it or vital signs or something like that, I just clip it right under there and I know I've got it. To the right, I have my checklists and my quick references. This little uh, booklet I've put together. On the top, I have my RSI checklist. If you don't use checklists, uh, you should read the Checklist Manifesto. It's a great book. But I also have like 12 lead ECG interpretations, uh, ideal body weight charts, things like that. That it, I don't use this a lot, but I know that I have it if I need it, especially if I'm feeling task overloaded or it's 3 a.m. and I'm just having a brain fart. And then on the outside, I keep this awesome piece of gear. All this is is a flexible gear tie. You can see I had it folded up, extends out this long. They, they make these in various sizes, um, but I, I like this one. I don't remember who makes this. Uh, let's see if it says, and it just says gear tie. I think I got this at like Home Depot or Lowe's or something like that. But these are really nice because they serve multiple functions. I've used these as carabiners. I've used these to help route vent circuits. So if the vent circuit's pulling on the patient, it's giving me high pips. What I'll do is create a larger loop and hook this around the vent circuit on like the seatbelt or something like that. And then it keeps it from bending. Also, I use these instead of those plastic ones that come with secondary tubing. If I'm giving a piggyback, you can actually use one of these coupled with a carabiner and achieve the same thing and get the appropriate gravitational position so that you can administer a secondary uh, partial fill, which is really nice. And again, you can just fold it right up and I just slip it in this back pocket. 
And that's it for the le lower leg pocket on the right side. Now moving up, again, I'm gonna start medially first. This medial pocket I keep empty. And you're saying, well, that's a big pocket. Why wouldn't you take advantage of it? Well, the reason is because I also have my trauma shears for items right next to it. These are pretty heavy. And I find that when I put anything in this pocket, it loads me down. It just feels like it's too heavy. It's uncomfortable. Again, I want to be mobile. I want to be able to do my job. Another reason I keep this pocket empty is because I use my leg as a writing surface sometimes. I may put some thick strips of tape here to write down information on the tape. Or if I need to write something on a piece of paper and I don't have a clipboard available to me and I don't want to pull out my notebook cover, I can just jot down something on my leg. And uh, yeah, it allows me to do that. So I find that to be a, a greater benefit. Uh, moving laterally, the first pocket I have filled with hemostats. Now, these hemostats, like most, do have teeth on the end. So if you're using hemostats for things like clamping ET tubes, clamping chest tubes, this can compromise the integrity of those plastic tubings. So you really shouldn't be doing that. It's poor practice. If that's something you want to do with a hemostat like this, you should really, at the very least, put tape around these teeth, which is normally what I do. I don't have them on there all the time because I do still use hemostats where I need the teeth on occasion, so I can just wrap those if I need to. But then again, uh, definitely an essential piece in my opinion. I find that I use those pretty regularly. Next to that are my one shear trauma shears. Now, as a disclaimer, um, most people probably know one shear is one of our podcast sponsors. But these things are awesome. Even if they weren't a sponsor, I would, I would have a pair of these just because they're so robust. These are not the cheap shears that your company gives out for free. These things are high quality. There's an oxygen wrench on them. And these are actually the Heavy Lies of the Helmet exclusive ones, though. You can see the logos rubbed off, and that's only because as a CEO, you get the privilege of getting all the prototypes and the, the damaged merch. <laughs> so, so that's what I've got. But the sh it hasn't affected the shears. The shears work great. I just, we couldn't sell them like that. Which is fine with me. I don't need fancy things. And then next to that is my other flashlight that I mentioned before. Again, this is a four sevens. Again, I don't think they're a company, but simple operation. I don't have to worry about going through strobe and SOS and things like that. It's just single function. It's got the cap button, which I really like, deep carry pocket clip, and it's pretty short, but still gives me enough lumens that I could do a walk around and be able to assess the aircraft appropriately or navigate if I'm in the dark outside somewhere and there's low light. And that's it. It's really not a lot of stuff. I don't know how much it weighs altogether, but I will say the way I have it distri distribute, the way I have it distributed. I find that I'm still able to function highly and not have to worry about being bogged down. So I hope this helped. If it did, please let me know. Give me some feedback. If you have any additional questions, obviously you can go to the show notes or contact me at contact at heavyliesthehelmet.com. Happy to give you some feedback or answer anything that you might have. But I will leave you with this. Number one, whatever you decide to carry, Make sure that you know how to use it, first and foremost. Number two, carry things that make sense. Carry things that are going to make your job easier, that are applicable for your mission profile. And then number three, I would say, don't let anyone tell you what you should carry. Don't let anyone try to tell you not to carry something or to make fun of you for it. Because the fact of the matter is, if that piece of equipment or gear helps you take better care of patients, and to make you safer, then you should go for it and go ahead and carry it and forget all the haters. Yeah.